different again. We, next week's a special theme as well, so I want to wait till we uh, come back uh, after next week uh, to get back into our study through the Gospel of Mark. Take your Bibles, go to the New Testament book of Philippians today, the New Testament book of Philippians. Um, we're going to be in chapter 1 of Philippians this morning. If you don't have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to, to grab one out of the back of the pew in front of you there. You'll find Philippians 1 on page 1,164, 1164 in the Pew Bible. Life is hard, is it not? Okay, uh, good, it's good. Y'all awake? Life is hard, it really is. Uh, life is hard, uh, we experience difficulty in life, um, if we uh, keep sitting around waiting on some new invention or technology to suddenly make everything easier, we invent something, we come up with something, we think this is going to make life easier, and it winds up making things harder. I'm scared to death of what's going to happen with all this AI technology. Like, what is that going to do? I mean, I saw, like, like AI robots in a football game the other day, one of the NFL games. Like, I'm just thinking they're occupying seats that real, I don't know, it's just kind of weird to me what's going on. This AI stuff kind of scares me, but life's hard it's difficult uh, and if we just sit around waiting on something to make it easier or we sit around waiting on uh, just the future to suddenly make all of our problems go away that's not ever going to arrive uh, in life because we live in a sin cursed world in life we experience difficulty hardships suffering adversity. We get bad news. There are seasons in life where it seems as if every day presents a new challenge that's just harder to overcome than the one we did the day before. In the context of a life filled with hardship and difficulty and adversity, I think if there's one ingredient one ingredient that is missing from most of our lives that holds the promise of making the most profound impact in our everyday lives and in the lives of those around us and in our journey with Christ. If there's one thing missing, it would be joy. Joy. I was just thinking about that a little bit this week, like to speak on something special in between this kind of in-between season here before we get back into Mark. I kept coming back to this concept of joy, joy in the Christian life. In Nehemiah chapter 8, we're told, uh, Nehemiah said to the people, the joy of the Lord is your strength. In Psalm 118 verse 24, we're told, uh, this is the day, the psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I had this speech professor in college, okay? She would come in at like 8 a.m. Speech class was at like 8 a.m., and, and it was just awful. And she would come in at like 8 a.m., bubbling, excited, happy. Every time, every class period, she would begin with that. This is the day the Lord has made. I mean, I've been up like eight minutes at this point, you know? And she was just over the top, joyful every time. I'll never forget that. Every class, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, David prayed in Psalm 51 after his uh, sin. He prayed in Psalm 51 as he confessed his sin. And part of that prayer of confession and repentance, David said that he asked for the Lord to restore to him the joy of his salvation. In Galatians 5, Paul lists joy as a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, Peace. Joy is one of those fruits of the Spirit. There are some others that are listed there too. Uh, we're commanded many times in Scripture to rejoice and to be joyful. It's throughout the Scripture. Psalm 96, 11, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice. Matthew 5, 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, Jesus said. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice and then at the end, toward the end of that great book of Romans that Paul wrote, Romans 14, verse 17, Paul wrote, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace 
and joy in the Holy Spirit. Joy. If there's one thing missing from our lives, and quite frankly, missing from your expressions right now, it is joy, all right? (laughs) Joy. There is one thing that I think holds the greatest potential to impact our lives in the everyday the lives of those around us, and in our Christian walk with the Lord, in our journey with Christ, one thing, and that is the the joy of the Lord. I want to talk about that a little bit today. First, I want to talk about what joy is not. What what Christian joy is not? Uh, Here's a couple things. Christian joy is not, it's not a happy-go-lucky attitude despite what you're going through. It's not merely being optimistic about the future. It's not happiness in the present circumstances that are good. So, so this is not Christian joy. Christian joy is not this just no matter what you're going through, it's all going to be fine, happy-go-lucky, not aware of the potential impact or the consequences of what maybe you're, you're experiencing right now. It's not this just lackadaisical, happy-go-lucky attitude despite what you're going through. That's not Christian joy. It's not merely being optimistic about the future. I think sometimes we confuse Christian joy with this. We think people that are joy-filled are those people who just think it's going to get better. That's their thought. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. And they think that. And then they're miserable in the present, but their hope is what's going to get better. But then it never does. And they go throughout life looking for a day when circumstances will be different. It's also not just happiness in present circumstances that are good. Sometimes we see people who are excited, they have happiness in their expression, they have joy in their heart, and that kind of exudes out of them, but it's, it's only temporary. It only lasts as long as the circumstance lasts. That may happen to be good. That, that's not uh, Christian joy. All of these things are counterfeits. I want to shed a little light on this for everybody right now as the lights are shedding some light. These are counterfeits to what real Christian joy is. And it's not that these things, these things are not like necessarily wrong. They just shouldn't be confused with genuine Christian joy. Even non-Christians can have these things. One other thing Christian joy is not that I think is confusing for, for many of us. Christian joy is not incompatible with sorrow and grief. I think sometimes we wrongly believe this, as Christians especially. We, we think Christian joy means the absence of sorrow or grief or crying or weeping or mourning. In fact, the Bible commands us in certain p- places under certain situations, we are actually commanded to grieve and to weep and to mourn. It's not the opposite of sorrow or grief. Really, the opposite of joy Christian joy, the opposite truly of Christian joy, is not sorrow or grief, it's, it's hopelessness and despair. It's not that you're sorrowful over a situation that you're going through, but it's the feeling of hopelessness and total despair. That would be the opposite of Christian joy. The late Tim Keller put it like this in his description of joy. He wrote, joy is delight in God. Whether the sun is shining or it's cloudy, joy is delight in God and His salvation for the sheer beauty and worth of who He is. Its opposite is hopelessness and despair. Its counterfeit is elation that comes with blessings, not the blesser, uh, mood swings based on circumstances. Those are opposites of Christian joy. Josh McDowell put it like this. He wrote, real joy, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, real joy, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, is a supernatural transaction we experience with God. He described it as this, the soul deep assurance that helps us to face cancer, bankruptcy, the end of our marriage, loneliness. It's that soul deep assurance that helps us face things like that because we know that Jesus is carrying us through it that He is carrying us through it. 
John Piper described it this way, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul. There's an emotion connected to this. It is a good feeling in the soul produced by the Holy Spirit as He causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. Now, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps, perhaps many of us are more described, rather than this, we're more described as going through life stressed out, worried, or fearful. That probably describes many of us most of the time. Uh, I was reading, just kind of skimming through Jerry Bridges. Anything you can read by Jerry Bridges, you should read it. Uh, he wrote uh, The Blessing of Humility, The Pursuit of Holiness, The Practice of Godliness, uh, Trusting God, Transforming Grace. He, another book he wrote is called Respectable Sins, Respectable Sins. And he just talks about a list of sins in there that Christians have kind of, you know, we, we've kind of tolerated within ourselves or they're kind of acceptable among Christians. You know, you can even kind of brag a little bit about certain sins. And anyway, in his list of respectable sins, which shouldn't be respectable or acceptable, but in his list that he presented of kind of those things, he talked about uh, in the list, anxiety and worry and fear. And one that kind of grabbed my attention was frustration. He listed frustration as one of these sins that Christians have kind of tolerated and accepted. Frustration frustration. Any of you ever been frustrated lately? Thanks for the honesty. We've got a few uh, willing to admit. You get frustrated. And I was reading through that, and I was so convicted by that. Frustration? How is that a sin? It's a holy frustration, I'm, I'm feeling, right? And we want to justify it. We want to rationalize it. But he talked about frustration being connected to this list of sins that we've sort of accepted and tolerated. What is frustration? You're frustrated that something's not happening exactly the way you want it to happen. Anybody know somebody like that? You married to somebody like that? They get frustrated when things... Don't raise your hand, Allison. <clears throat> you get frustrated, right? Frustration. Why, why is this a problem? And, and how does this... How does this counter Christian joy in our life? See, a lot of what's happening when we're frustrated is something's not happening the way we want it to be happening. It's not happening as fast. as It's not going according to our plan. Our total mind and thought is on what we're trying to accomplish. We're not recognizing in the midst of that where we're just totally frustrated and angry and irritated. We're not recognizing that a sovereign God is not disconnected from that event in our life that's not going according to our plan at the moment. Even that detail of a traffic jam that we get, you get so irritated, you can't get to where you're going, you're going to be late. And you're frustrated that this is happening to you. And that frustration is a moment where we're being consumed by our present circumstances and our plans, not recognizing a sovereign God who is even involved in something as routine and mundane as that. Well, <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 1, we, we, I want to read a few verses today that are written by a guy who, if anybody had reason to be, ang to be anxious or worried or frustrated, if anybody had reason for that, it was Paul when he wrote this letter. He has every reason to be frustrated. But in this letter, listen to what he writes, starting in verse 12. <clears throat> Paul writes, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, for just a moment there, stop. You say, what, <clears throat> what has happened? What has happened to Paul? Well, he has been imprisoned for his preaching and teaching of the gospel, for preaching and teaching that Jesus Christ had indeed been resurrected and raised from the dead that we could be saved through faith in Jesus, believing that gospel message, because he wouldn't be quiet about that. He's been imprisoned for this. He's been taken to Rome 
all along the way to Rome, he experienced shipwreck where they nearly died, washed up on an island, was bitten by a poisonous viper, (laughs) and now he's in Rome, and he's a prisoner in Rome, all for preaching the gospel, awaiting to find out, how's this going to go? Are they going to kill me for this? He's being obedient to God. He's been obedient to Christ. He's boldly proclaiming the gospel. And he says here in this letter, while he is a prisoner, while he is a prisoner, I want you to know that all this that has happened to me, what has happened to me, verse 12, has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, he wrote, having become confident in the, in the Lord by my imprisonment, they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some, notice this, this is not a good circumstance he's about to describe here either. Some preach Christ from envy and rivalry. That's not good. But others from goodwill, the latter doing it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But notice this, verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. <clears throat> but notice his response, what then? You know, what do I do with that? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I, what's that word? Rejoice. Yes, and I will. What's that word? For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Even when he talks about his deliverance and he sets his hope on something in the future, he doesn't know if he's going to live or die. But he is confident that Christ will be honored. Verse 21, for me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I, I know that I will remain and continue with you all. He believed God still had something to do <clears throat> for him and with him, for your progress. See, he, look at how he's concerned about them, the ones he's writing to, the church in Philippi. Uh, he believes God will keep them here for their sake, for their progress and their joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ because of my coming to you again. <laughs> we'll stop there. I just want to focus on this overwhelming idea of joy and the way the Apostle Paul was able to maintain this in, in this in the midst of incredibly difficult circumstances. You know, throughout this letter, Paul uses, I think it's a little over 100 verses, four chapters, it's very short. He uses the words joy and rejoice 16 times in this short, in this short little letter. You know, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a more difficult circumstance that one could be going through than literally being imprisoned for righteousness. Wrongfully imprisoned, held captive for being obedient to God and for doing what is right. You know, several New Testament letters are called prison epistles because they're written while Paul is a prisoner. The book of Revelation The whole book of Revelation was written while John was a prisoner exiled on the island of Patmos. Uh, And then later in the history of the church, John Bunyan, John Bunyan, he received inspiration to write Pilgrim's Progress from prison. Bunyan, a Christian pastor, 
was imprisoned during his lifetime because <clears throat> in England, the Anglican uh, church controlled the state. The state controlled the church, and they persecuted him because he was not in agreement with some of the church policies. He was imprisoned for 10 years. 10 years. Yet, in the midst of that, he was inspired to write one of the greatest works of English religious literature of all time. At one point, it was the second, it was the second most selling book, second only to the Bible. David Jeremiah writes, the prisons of our lives can often become places of great opportunity and ministry. When Paul writes in verse 12 of Philippians 1, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. What has happened to him has not been a desirable turn of events. In fact, if you were writing the script of your life and you were in his position, you'd have never scripted it that way. <clears throat> you would have never signed up to go through imprisonment, shipwreck, hardship, all the things that he went through. You would have never signed up to have people preaching the gospel in such a way that they were trying to do it just to add insult to your injury. <laughs> you wouldn't have done that. You wouldn't have signed up to go through the things that Paul has gone through and yet, as he looks at what he has experienced and what he is experiencing, he has the ability, through the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, producing what we call Christian joy in him, to write a letter that is just filled with perspective and joy on every page. He'd been arrested, he'd been beaten, he'd been whipped. And yet, look at that passage. What has happened has served to advance the gospel. Others have become more bold to preach the gospel because of this. <laughs> I rejoice because Christ is proclaimed. One thing is for sure. Christian joy, the fruit of the Spirit, what we're commanded to pursue in life, what I think holds the promise to change our lives more than maybe anything else as we walk with Christ, one thing is for sure, it is not dependent. Joy is not dependent upon external circumstances. Some of the most miserable people in the world have the most favorable circumstances. Good circumstances do not equal joy. Difficult circumstances do not equal a miserable countenance, okay? When you look at Paul, when you look at the, the Apostle Paul, and you, you look at everything that he's gone through, and you look at where he currently is, he's currently, as I said, a prisoner in Rome. More technically, we describe it as being under house arrest at this particular time. He had a private residence he was allowed to live in, <clears throat> but he had a member of the Roman guard chained to his wrist every minute of every day and night. Imagine that. Like, that's difficult to imagine. Everywhere you go, everything you do, you're, you, you know, you, you've got this guy chained to you, different ones changing in and out. But he was able, <clears throat> Paul was able to maintain joy in the midst of these difficult circumstances because he believed in the sovereignty of God, he acknowledged the providence of God, and he delighted in the furtherance of the gospel above all else. I mean, you see that so clearly in the verses, just the few verses that we've read in this letter. <clears throat> he notices <clears throat> how it has served to advance the gospel. He, 
acknowledges <clears throat> that God is in control. And he delights in the furtherance of the gospel above everything else. One of the things that God uses, one of the things God uses to conform us into the image of Christ are pivotal circumstances, suffering, hardship, and adversity. God uses difficulties, tragedies, and adversities in life to accomplish greater things. <clears throat> I promise you, none of us would have signed up to write our life the way that Paul's played out in those last years. And if you think back over your life, for those of you that have lived just a little while on this earth and you've experienced difficulties or hardships, if you think back about those, you would probably admit that God used it in some way to produce a growth in you to accomplish something in you that could not be accomplished otherwise. There are always hidden purposes behind the adversity and the difficulty that God's children experience and behind the circumstances that we go through. I like what John Sanderson writes. John Sanderson wrote, To continually wear a gloomy countenance is practical atheism. To continually wear a gloomy countenance is practical atheism. Why? It ignores God and His attributes. See, one of God's attributes is this idea of God being sovereign, that He's in control of everything. And then the idea of the providence of God, not just that God is in control and that He's sitting back behind the scenes removed from everything, but the idea of His providence speaks to the fact that He's actually working out events in your life to accomplish purposes that are greater than what you can see in the moment. And so when we go through life consistently frustrated, anxious, worried, gloomy, because circumstances in the moment are not favorable, we're failing to recognize God is involved in that. It's living practically as if God doesn't exist. <laughs> I like how Chuck, uh, Chuck Swindoll uh, I like how he defines joy. Chuck Swindoll defines joy as this, an attitude that stems from our confidence that God is in control. I love that. That's probably the simplest definition you could give. Joy is an attitude that stems from our confidence that God is in control. See, it doesn't have anything to do with the circumstances, whether they're good or bad. It has everything to do with our attitude and recognizing the fact that God is in control, that we're confident of that. That changes the way that we live. It changes our countenance. Swindoll went on to write, I've discovered that a joyful countenance has nothing to do with one's age or one's occupation or lack of it, or one's geography or education or marital status or good looks or bad looks or circumstances. Joy is a choice. Joy is a choice, he writes. Joy is a matter of attitude that stems from one's confidence at God, in God, that God is at work, that He is in full control, that He is in the midst of whatever has happened, is happening, or will happen. Either we fix our minds on that and determine to laugh again, or we wail and whine our way through life, complaining that we never got a fair shake. We are the ones who consciously determine which way we shall go. And I love the emphasis on the choice of this. Joy, I believe, is a fruit. It is a supernatural work of God. It is something the Holy Spirit produces, but we have a part to play in that. And we can choose to allow the Holy Spirit to produce that fruit of joy in our lives. We can choose that attitude, or we can choose to be grumpy, irritated, frustrated, and gloomy all the time. Ella Wheeler Wilcox put it like this in a poem, uh, one ship sails east, one ship sails west, regardless of how the winds blow. Why? 
because it's the set of the sail and not the gale that determines the way we go, <laughs> right? It's a choice. It's a choice. And you find people that have the best of circumstances and they're the most miserable, and you find people who have the worst of circumstances and they have the most incredible amounts of joy you've ever experienced before. This is not a matter of which way the wind is blowing as it is the way in which we have the sail set. We can choose to have that attitude of joy. Some of us need to write that on our mirror in the morning when we get up, right there on the mirror. I choose joy. Some of you need to write that on the mirror for your spouse, okay? I choose joy. Right? You just, we need to do that. But here, here's what I want to just kind of give you that I think helped Paul to understand this and to have this perspective that he expresses to us in just these three verses of 12 through 14. These three truths about difficulty that I think can release the joy of the Lord in us when we properly understand them and live them out. I'm just going to show them to you quickly today. But the first one is this. When it comes to difficulty, adversity, bad circumstances, what, what do we need to know about this? The first one is difficulty often advances the gospel. Paul points that out in his own life. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. Difficulty often advances the gospel. The word here, by the way, for advance, it has served to advance the gospel. The word for advance is a military term that Paul was using that referred to a unit going in before the army and removing rocks and trees and barriers and anything that might hinder the army from moving forward. And that's what Paul uses to say the gospel is being advanced through these circumstances. He's saying that the chains that he is experiencing and dealing with are blazing a trail, paving the way for the gospel to continue. That what he is going through is serving to remove barriers that might hinder the progress of the gospel. Do you ever think about that in the midst of your own difficulties and frustrations? Is this diagnosis that I'm dealing with, is this an opportunity of difficulty that could provide the gospel advancement? Could it provide for the advancement of the gospel? Do you ever think about that? Do we ever think about that with life when we're going through hardships and difficulties? Without this imprisonment that Paul was going through, the gospel's progress would have been slowed or obstructed. And for him, he viewed this as opening up a new way of ministry for him. He points to that. And in our own lives, we need to recognize that it is difficulty that often can serve to advance the gospel. Um, when, Christians, when Christians face suffering and adversity and hardship, and they face it with joy, with that attitude that is, you know, communicated to others, even through our countenance, when that attitude is communicated through our countenance, an attitude that puts our confidence in God, that rests in the confidence that God is in control, when we communicate that to others, it is an incredible gospel witness and testimony where the gospel can be advanced. The second, just plainly, is that it provides opportunities to witness. In verse 13, Paul goes and says, look, he writes about this and he says, it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. For him, he points out this literally created opportunities for his faith in Christ and the gospel to become known to this huge group of soldiers in Rome that would have maybe never otherwise heard. Every minute of every hour of every day, day and night, he had a Roman soldier chained to him. <laughs> For two years, two years, this wasn't a short little stint, this was two years. Every six hours, the shift would change. Every six hours, one soldier would unhook himself, and another one would hook himself up to Paul, and he'd be chained there for another shift. Every six hours, some have estimated 
over the course of these two years, he could have been guarded by as many as 3,000 different soldiers. Okay, I just want you to imagine this for just a moment. Okay, this is Paul. This is the greatest missionary ever, okay, right? Whose whole life is about advancing the gospel, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's dealing with a group of people who know nothing really about this. Who's, I mean, who's really imprisoned being chained to the Apostle Paul, right? Can you imagine that for just a moment? I mean, who's the real ones in prison there? Six hours. And, and during these six hours, he's writing letters like this one right here that we're reading. He's writing this. He's talking to them. He's sharing the gospel with them. If you go to the end of Philippians, which I, I, if you still got your Bible, if you go back to Philippians chapter 4, if you go to the end, when he kind of gives that final greeting starting in verse 21, so he's writing to the church in Philippi, and he writes, greet every saint. So he's just telling the church there, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially, especially those of Caesar's household. That points to the salvation, the gospel being received by some even in Caesar's household, some even that are a part of this imperial guard that would have heard the witnessing of the Apostle Paul over those two years. Over the periods of time, they would have been chained to his side. Some even point to the fact that this phrase, those of Caesar's household, doesn't only refer to soldiers Paul personally would have led to faith in Christ, but to others who these soldiers themselves would have shared with and led to faith in Christ. That the way in which the phrase is put together, it speaks to not just those soldiers coming to faith in Christ, but even some that the soldiers led to faith in Christ. Paul, in the midst of all of this, could have been, like most of us are, grumbling and complaining and whining about our circumstances. And if anybody had reason to, it would have been him. He's done everything God has asked him to do. He's been obedient to God along the way. He's been putting his life at risk. But he has joy because his focus is not on those circumstances unless he can see how those circumstances are something God's using as a tool to get the gospel proclaimed. <laughs> but how many of us think that way? We look at our situations and our difficulties and we think, how, how does this provide an opportunity for witness? And Paul was focused on that. That enabled him, released the joy of the Lord in his life. The last one, just quickly, is this. Difficulty produces not just, does it provide opportunities to witness and not just does it advance the gospel, but it produces confidence in other believers. There in Philippians chapter 1, verse 14, he said, And most of the brothers... Even because of his difficulty that he was facing and experiencing and handling properly, <laughs> choosing this attitude, he said, most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. He's like, like this circumstance that he's finding himself in, that he has every reason we would say to complain about, no, he says... Not only has it served to advance the gospel, not only has it allowed me opportunities to witness to a group of people I never would have been able to witness to that have come to faith in Christ, not only does it do that, it's even strengthening the faith of the brothers and sisters in Christ, the brethren. They are becoming more confident as a result of the circumstance that God in His sovereignty providentially is allowing Paul to go through. Other believers are strengthened, God uses you to strengthen other believers when you maintain the right attitude of joy in the midst of difficulty and adversity.
there was a um, it was a very good uh, baseball pitcher that uh, experienced a real difficult set of circumstances back in 1988. Um, left-handed pitcher who'd been in the, the major leagues for about six years, Dave Dravecki. Uh, Dave Dravecki. He pitched for the San Diego Padres. He was pitching for the San Francisco Giants. And in 1988, after six years in the league, he discovered in his pitching arm uh, a cancerous tumor. The doctors found a cancerous tumor in his pitching arm, and they had to go in and they had to remove half of his deltoid muscle, and he was told he'll never pitch again. This is devastating, difficult news for him. It was very difficult news for his wife, Jan. You can read her story about um, anxiety and panic attacks that she dealt with, feeling that she had no control. Uh, you can read about that in her book called A Joy I'd Never Known. A Joy I'd Never Known. But even though he'd been told he'd never pitch again, he worked, he worked, he worked, he worked. The following season, 1989, he came back and he pitched again overcoming the odds, defying what he was told. First game back, he pitched a winning game. Five days later, he was set to pitch again. And while he was pitching to Tim Raines of the Expos, he threw the pitch that's been described as the pitch that could be heard around the world because as he went to make that pitch, his arm snapped, the bone broke in half, and he collapsed to the infield. Sometime after that, they would find out that the cancer had returned, and the doctors had to amputate his entire left arm to keep the cancer from spreading. Several weeks after having his arm removed, he came back to San Francisco to the stadium to publicly thank everyone for their support, to glorify God, and to praise Him. And somehow he was able to demonstrate joy in the midst of what could only be described as one of the most imaginably difficult circumstances that he's going through. He specifically gave praise to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior when he spoke that day. The very next day, he received 700 speaking invitations nationwide. And for the last 30 plus years, he and his wife have had a ministry of traveling around the country and proclaiming the joy of the Lord as their strength and the gospel of Jesus Christ opportunities to share a message that will change people for eternity, opportunities that were only possible through one of the most adverse and difficult circumstances anyone in that position could imagine to face. John Piper said it this way once, and he said, every day, in every circumstance, God is doing 10,000 things in your life. You may only be aware of three of them. Every day, in every circumstance, God is doing 10,000 things in your life. And you may only be aware of three of them. I don't know how we can become more aware of what God's actually doing, but we can become aware that He is doing. He is doing something in your life. God does appoint. He appoints. He's not just sitting back passively and then responding as things happen. He appoints. He orchestrates. He appoints even our disappointments for purposes that are greater than we can see. The joy of the Lord is not dependent upon our circumstances. 
In fact, in the midst of adverse circumstances, it provides the greatest opportunity to demonstrate that supernatural ability the Holy Spirit gives us to maintain joy. So here's what I would just say to you as we close. Listen, circumstances are going to change. It's going to be good some days, it's going to be bad some days. Winds are going to change. It's going to be raining some days, it's going to be sun shining other days. You're going to get a job promotion one day, going to lose your job the next, going to get a good report from the doctor one visit, going to get a bad report from the doctor the next, going to have a child that listens to you when you ask them to do something one day, and the next day they're going to do the most rebellious thing you've ever seen, right? It's just circumstances are going to change. But my encouragement is to trust in God's sovereignty, acknowledge his hand of providence in the midst of it all, And delight in the spread of the gospel above all else. Think, how is God working? And how can I use this as an opportunity to demonstrate the joy of the Lord that will lead to the spread of the gospel in the midst of this? Father, I pray, Lord, in this time together today that you would help us to Uh, recapture, recapture through the working of the Holy Spirit in us, recapture some of, demonstrate some of the joy that comes only from you. No one else in all of life except for followers of Christ, Lord, no one else in all of life can have an attitude of joy in the midst of difficulty because we can see that you're up to something. Even if we don't know what it is, we can trust you're up to something. You know better than we do, and we can trust you. We see it throughout the pages of Scripture. The Apostle Paul, going through hard, difficult circumstances, he knew you were doing something. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to trust in you, recognize your control, acknowledge you in everything that's happening, and seek to understand how whatever we're going through could provide a way for the gospel message to be advanced, for your glory, for the strengthening of the saints, for the saving of many people for eternity. This is what we pray for. Restore to us joy from you. In Christ's name, amen.